sets the difference between a beginner and an advanced Excel user is the ability to perform tasks by using shortcuts. Besides saving a lot of time, shortcuts give you access to functionality that does not exist on the ribbon. However, the problem with shortcuts is to memorize them. I am Nabil Murad. In this tutorial, I share with you my top 60 favorite shortcuts, broken into 15 categories. I explain them using a mind mapping method to create an association in your mind and help you memorize them with the least effort. So let's dive in. Here is my start file. You can download the exercise file and follow along by clicking on the link below this video. You can maximize the work area in Excel by reducing the size of the ribbon. And to collapse the ribbon, we use the shortcut Ctrl F1. It's a toggle shortcut. You hit Ctrl F1 to collapse and you hit Ctrl F1 to expand. When you collapse the ribbon by hitting Ctrl F1, it keeps the labels of the tab and it keeps the quick access toolbar and the title bar. Should you wish to have Excel fill the entire window and use Excel in full screen, then you use the shortcut Ctrl Shift F1. When I hit Ctrl Shift F1, now the work area of Excel is filling the entire window. It's another toggle shortcut. So to bring back the ribbon, I hit Ctrl Shift F1. With over 17 billion cells in Excel, it's good to be comfortable navigating and selecting your cells in a huge Excel worksheet. So if you have a huge list, you can select the entire list by using the shortcut Ctrl Asterisk. The asterisk is the multiplication symbol on the numeric keypad. And the control asterisk is different than hitting control A, especially when you are dealing with a table. So this is the list. I don't see a contextual tab in the ribbon, but if I scroll down, I have the same exact records in a table. So when I select any single cell in the table, I see a contextual tab, the design contextual tab related to the table functionality. And the control A in a table works incrementally. So if I hit control A, there are two issues. When I hit control A, then it selects the entire table without the column headers. If you want to select the column header, the control A works incrementally. So you have to hit control A a second time. And in both cases, the cell from which I started my selection is always the active cell. But look what happens when I hit control asterisk instead of control A. So I'm hitting control asterisk. The behavior in a table is exactly like in a list. It selects the entire list, including the table headers. And the active cell is always the cell in the upper left corner. What's the importance of having the active cell in the upper left corner? I'm going to repeat in a list. So I'm selecting any single cell and then I hit control asterisk. The active cell is in the upper left corner of my list. So what if I want to navigate to the opposite corner, the lower right corner? So I'm going simply to rotate the active cell and I'm going to move the active cell from the upper left to the upper right to the lower right and so on. I'm going to rotate clockwise by using the shortcut control period. So when I hit control period, I'm activating the upper right, control period, the lower right, and then control period, the lower left, control period, the upper left and so on. So what if I want to navigate? What if I want to jump to the lower right corner if I have tens of thousands of records? I hit control period twice, control period, control period, and then I want to select this specific cell, which is the active cell right now. I want to shrink my selection, and the shortcut is shift backspace. When I hit shift backspace, I'm shrinking my selection to the active cell. After shrinking my selection to the active cell, what if I want to select the entire row? Starting from this selected cell to select the entire row, I hit the shortcut Shift Spacebar. 
I can shrink one more time using the previous shortcut, Shift Backspace, and from the selected cell I can select an entire column, and to do that I hit the shortcut, Control Space Bar. I can shrink my selection one more time, Shift Backspace, and now I want to show you the fastest technique of navigation in a list is to hover over the border of the selected cell and look at the mouse pointer. When the mouse pointer turns to a four-headed arrow, you can simply double-click on the border and you jump to the top. If you double-click on the lower border of the selected cell, you go to the very bottom. If you double-click on the left border, you go to the very left. If you double-click on the right border, you go to the right. And that's a very fast technique of navigation. Entering data in Excel is a time-consuming task that we can't avoid, but we can shorten the time by using some interesting shortcuts. So if you want to insert a date, instead of typing it, you can use the shortcut Control semicolon. If you want to insert the time, you can use the shortcut Control shift semicolon, and that inserts the time. Both of them are static. They do not update when you close and reopen the file later on. When entering records in a list, most of the time we are referring to the same products, to the same regions, to the same clients, to the same patients or students. So in this case, instead of retyping the information, I can let Excel create a list on the fly, and I do that by hitting the shortcut Alt Down Arrow. Excel populates a list at runtime, and I can select whichever option I want from the drop list without having to type. I can also enter data in Excel by using the flash fill functionality. And the concept of flash fill is that you create a model and you ask Excel to replicate that model. So in this example, I have a column of first name and a column of last name, and I want to combine them into a full name. So I'm going to create the first entry, Ted Rogers, and there I hit enter. And to let Excel replicate the pattern, I use the flash fill functionality using the shortcut Control E. Sometimes you need to copy a set of values. Like in row number one, I have some labels and I want to copy them down. So I want to copy them to row number two. Down starts with letter D, so I'm going to use the shortcut Control D. I can also copy a set of values to the right. So I select the destination cell and I would like to copy these amount to the right. Copying to the right is very useful when we combine it with the functionality of conditional formatting, as I'm going to do right now. First of all, I'm going to copy the numbers to the right. Right starts with letter R, so I hit Control R to copy to the right. Then I'm going to create a data bar conditional formatting to represent the different amounts for the different regions. So I select the range, and I use the shortcut Control Q F, and then I hit Tab, and then I hit enter and I would have created the conditional formatting data bars. If you wish, you can hide the numbers and rely on the numbers you copy to the right. And we do that by going to conditional formatting, select manage rules, and from here I'm going to edit the rule and keep the data bar only by checking the box show bar only. When I hit OK twice, now you see the importance of copying the numbers to the right because the data bars do not have the numbers and they are clean and clear to see. When entering data, you might need to switch columns into rows. You might need to transpose a list. In our example, I have a list of products and then I have some sales amount. I would like to select this entire list and switch the columns into rows. So I hit Control asterisk to select the entire list. I hit Control C to copy, and then I go to the destination. I'm going to transpose my list by using the shortcut Alt E S E, and then I hit Enter. And I would have flipped my table. The columns become rows, and the rows become columns. Text formatting is a popular task we perform in Excel. There is a group of shortcuts. All of them consist of a control key plus a number from 1 to 5. All of them are related to text formatting. So if I hit control 1, I'm opening the most popular dialog box in Excel, the format cell dialog box. I'm going to hit cancel. 
If I have a set of text and I want to bold the text, I can use the shortcut Control 2. If I hit Control 2 a second time, I'm unbolding the text. I can also italicize the text by hitting the shortcut Control 3. So Control 3 to italicize and Control 3 to turn it back to regular. I can also underline the text by hitting the shortcut Control 4 and Control 4 another time to remove the underline. If you cancel a transaction, you can use the strike through formatting to denote that this is a canceled transaction. I can do that by hitting the shortcut Control 5. So if I hit Control 5 one more time, I'm removing the strike through. So Control 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that corresponds to the format cell dialog box, bold, italic, underline, and strike through, respectively. There is a set of shortcuts related to number formatting. All of them consist of two modifier keys and a number from 1 to 5. Control shift 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 5, these are related to number formatting. Let me show you how it works. I have in column A a set of numbers, so if I select them and hit the shortcut Control shift 1, that applies number formatting. In column B, I have some decimal numbers corresponding to time. They do not look like time until I apply a time formatting, and I do that by using the shortcut Control shift 2 In column C, I have some numbers that correspond to a date. We know that a date is stored in Excel as a number. Day number 1 is the 1st of January 1900, but they do not look like date until I apply a date formatting, and the easiest way is to use the shortcut Control shift 3 I have some numbers in column D, and I would like to format them in a monetary formatting, so I use the shortcut Control shift 4 for currency formatting. In column E, I would like to apply percentage formatting, so I use the shortcut Control shift 5 so Control shift 1 for number formatting, Control shift 2 for time, Control shift 3 for date, Control shift 4 for currency, Control shift 5 for percentage formatting. If you want to check formulas in your Excel file, you can check the formulas one at a time either by selecting the cell having the formula and keep an eye on the formula bar, or by hitting the F2 key to look at the formula inside the cell in the edit mode of Excel. But what if you would like to see all the formulas in one single step? Well, you can do that by using the shortcut Control Accent. Accent is to the left side of number one on an American keyboard. When you hit Control Accent, you see all the formulas in one single screen and you can print it if you want to document your formulas. It's a toggle shortcut, so if I hit Control Accent a second time, then I'm switching from the formulas to the result of the formulas. You might have noticed that in column G, when I hit Control Accent, I have the same exact formula copied all the way down, with the exception of some cells where I have a hard-coded number. So I'm going to hit Control Accent one more time. We have a shortcut that enables you to identify the cells with differences from the selected cell. So if I have G2 selected, I want to select the entire column, I hit the shortcut shift Control down arrow, and now I would like to identify those cells having differences, so I hit the shortcut Control shift backslash The cells having differences from the formula in the active cell are now selected. When we copy a formula, Excel automatically adjusts the cell reference to reflect a new position, and that's wonderful. But what if I copy a formula and I don't want the cell reference to change? Like in this situation when I copied the formula down, it's returning a zero because I don't have any contents in row number 61. What if I want to copy the same exact formula with the same exact reference? I'm going to undo and in this case, I'm going to use the shortcut Control apostrophe followed by hitting Enter. So if I put the formula in the edit mode, it's the same exact formula 
like the cell above. I can also copy the result of a formula, so I can do that by selecting the cell below, and then I hit the shortcut, Control shift apostrophe, and in this case, if you look at the formula bar, you see that it copied the result of the formula, not the formula itself. When we create a formula in Excel, we are guided by the formula argument in the screen tip. So if I type equal V lookup as an example, I can read the arguments in the screen tip. What if I want to save these arguments for reference or for training? I want to save them in the worksheet. Then in this case, I use the shortcut Control shift a and then to neutralize the equal sign so that Excel doesn't deal with it as a formula, I type a single apostrophe or a single quotation before the equal sign and then I hit enter and now I have a reference to the formula arguments inside the cell. When you create advanced formulas, with multiple levels of nesting, it's a good practice to expand the formula bar in order to read the contents of this formula and to enable you to create multiple levels of nesting. If you want to collapse the formula bar, then you click on the up pointing arrow in the upper right corner. Alternatively, you can do that by using the shortcut Control shift u to expand the formula bar, and it's a toggle shortcut, so if you hit Control shift u then you will be collapsing the formula bar. Another good practice when creating advanced nested functions is to split the formula into multiple lines. So if I want to split this formula, I can click at the beginning of each nested function and hit the shortcut Alt-Enter. I can split the formula into multiple lines and that improves the readability of my function. Every time I hit Alt-Enter, I'm moving to a new line and the formula will work just fine. And my formula will be easy to read when I split it into multiple lines using the shortcut Alt-Enter. It's a good practice to audit your formulas by checking the input values of your calculation, checking the precedence, and checking the dependence. This functionality is available on the formula step of the ribbon in the formula auditing group. If I select cell H8 and I want to find the input values for the calculation H7 and H5, I can use the shortcut Control and left square brackets so the precedence of this formula are selected. If I select H5 one more time, I can trace all the levels of precedence, so the precedence of the precedence by using the shortcut Control shift and left square bracket. All the precedence cells for all levels are selected in one single step. The opposite of tracing precedence is to trace dependence, so if I select cell C5, I would like to know which cells will be affected in case C5 changes. So I hit the shortcut Control and right brackets. All the dependent cells are selected. But these are the direct dependent cells. If you want to find the dependence of the dependence, all the levels of dependency, then you use the shortcut Control shift and right square brackets. All the dependent cells will be selected. Naming cells and ranges enables you to create professional calculations in Excel. So if you'd like to name a range, like the range of countries in column A, you select the range and to open the defined name dialog box, then you hit the shortcut Control alt f 3 I can give it a name, countries, and then hit enter and I would have named the range. I can also name multiple ranges simultaneously by using the labels in the top row or the labels in the left column. So in my list, I have a column for the year, a manager, a sales, cost of goods sold and profit. And I would like to name each column by using the values in the top row. And to do this, I select any single cell. I use the shortcut Control asterisk to select the entire list. And then I'll be using the shortcut Control shift f 3 Excel asks me, would you like to use the labels in the top row? Yes, where I hit OK, 
I would have named all the columns. Let me check. I go to the name box and click on the down arrow of the name box and if I select manager Excel recognizes the entire column by its name. If you decide later on that you would like to modify the name that you assign to ranges or even delete a named range then you have to go to the central location for naming and to do this I use the shortcut Control F3. That's the name manager where you can edit or delete named ranges. When you create lots of names in your worksheet, you might end up by forgetting the names, but luckily we have a shortcut to remind us of the names we created in the workbook, and I want to simulate this situation assuming that I want to sum the values in the sales column. So I'll be typing equal sum, and then I hit tab. At this moment, I don't remember the names, so I'm going to seek the help of Excel by hitting the shortcut F3 that opens the paste name dialog box I'll be selecting sales and then I hit OK and then I close the bracket. Now remember that all the functionality related to naming revolves around the F3 key. F3 is the paste name dialog box. Control Alt F3 to define a name. Control Shift F3 to create a name from selection. Control F3 to open the name manager. <laughs>
So if I scroll down, I have a pivot table which shows the sum of sales for a group of regions. What if I want to exclude the Midwest region? To exclude or filter out a record, I use the shortcut Control minus. What if I want to exclude the North as well? I hit Control minus another time and I'm excluding the North. Should you wish to release the filter, then I use the shortcut Alt AC. <laughs> Inserting a comment in a cell is very useful to add information that doesn't obstruct the view. So if you want to insert or edit a comment, the shortcut is Shift F2. So when I select a cell and hit Shift F2, I can write, we'll be attending a training. When you click away, you see the little red triangle in the upper right corner denoting that this cell has a comment. Should you wish to select all the comments in one single step, then you hit the shortcut, Control shift o Now that I'm selecting all the comments, should you wish to delete all the comments in one single step, then you hit the shortcut, Alt-R-D. When you have a list where you have a pattern in the data, like this list where I have different products in column B, and then I have the quarterly sales for each product, quarter 1, 2, 3, 4, followed by a total. These values come from the North region. I have the same pattern for the South and for other regions as well. I have products starting with A, and then a total for the products starting with A. Then I have the same pattern for the remaining products as well. In this case, should you wish to focus on high-level information, you create what we call an outline. An outline in Excel is a tool that enables you to create a structure that can be collapsed or expanded. And to create this outline, you have to go to the Data tab and go the long way. But there is a shortcut for creating this outline in one single step that replaces eight steps on the ribbon for applying and clearing the outline. When you use this shortcut for the first time, it displays a message box that will not appear anymore when you use it later on. And the shortcut is Control 8. When I hit Control 8, this message box won't appear anymore. When I hit OK, the outline will be created. So I can collapse by clicking on the minus sign, and I see the North total. I can expand by clicking on the plus sign. It also creates level buttons, and these level buttons are for the columns and rows. So if I click on level 1 for the columns, I'm collapsing all the columns. If I click on level 1 for the rows, I'm collapsing all the rows, and now I'm looking at high-level information. Should you wish to drill down into details, you click on level 2 for the columns or level 2 for the rows. Should you wish to remove the outline, then you use the same shortcut one more time, Control A to remove the outline, Control A to bring the outline. It's a toggle shortcut. In this example, I have a list of products in column A, I have a region in column B, and then I have some amounts for the prior year sales and the current year sales. If I want to create the sum of sales for the current year for each region, then the classic way will be creating either a sum if or a sum ifs or a sum product function. But I can do that in one single step and have much more options by using the subtotal tool. And the subtotal tool requires sorting the column upon which you base your subtotal. And we learned the shortcut for sorting. I'll be sorting the region by using the shortcut Alt ASA. Once you sort the region, now you are ready to use the subtotal tool. And to bring the subtotal tool, you can either go to the data tab of the ribbon, alternatively you can use the shortcut Alt-AB. In the subtotal dialog box, from the first drop list, select the column to which you apply the sorting, which is the region column. You can select among 11 different functions. I'll keep the sum function. I'll check where I want the subtotal to appear prior year and current year, and then I hit OK. And here is my subtotal. I have a subtotal for the east. I have a subtotal for the north without the hassle of creating formulas and functions. If I click on level number two, because it creates an outline as well, now I'm collapsing and I'm focusing on high level information. Should you wish to release the subtotal, then I use the same shortcut one more time to bring the dialog box, Alt-AB, 
and then in the dialog box I use the shortcut Alt R. You can add a text box, which is a floating object on top of the grid, by using the shortcut Alt and X. So if I hit the shortcut Alt and X, the mouse pointer changes to an inverted T, I can click and drag to create my text box, and I can type in my text box. A text box is a floating object on top of the grid, and a floating object doesn't live inside the grid, it doesn't live inside the cells, like a text box, like a chart, like a shape, like a picture, all these objects are called floating objects on top of the grid. When they overlap each other, it might be difficult to find and select all of them. Then in this case, it will be useful to bring a pane to the right side called the selection pane. And the shortcut for opening the selection pane works in both Excel and PowerPoint, and it is Alt F10. When you hit Alt F10, you open the selection pane, and you can select any floating object on top of the grid. When you hit Alt F10 one more time, you can close the selection pane. You can navigate between the different floating objects by using the Tab key on your keyboard. So when I hit Tab, I'm moving from one object to another object. If I hit Shift Tab, I'm moving in the opposite direction. There is a nice shortcut for hiding all the floating objects in one go, and this shortcut is Control 6. So when I hit Control 6, I'm hiding all the floating objects. When I hit Control 6 one more time, I bring them back. A chart is a graphic representation of numeric values. In this worksheet, I have a list of provinces and a list of discount. And instead of going through the numbers, I want to represent them graphically, so I'll be creating the default chart of Excel by using the shortcut Alt F1. And with a single step, I created a chart. I'm going to delete it. I can also create a chart and move it to a separate worksheet, specially designed for the chart by using the shortcut F11. A new sheet is created, and the chart is created in the new worksheet. I'm going to delete it. Right-click, Delete. Although a chart is a floating object on top of the grid, in 2004 an American engineer named Edward Tuft created a special type of chart, a tiny chart that lives in one single cell called a spark line. I want to create a spark line that compares the sales for the different months for each category. So I select the range, and then I hit the shortcut Control Q S and then I click on the spark line I want and I would have created a spark line. You can get statistics about your worksheet and your workbook on the fly by using a simple shortcut Control Shift G. When you hit Control Shift G it opens the workbook statistics, an extremely useful functionality. It shows me statistics about the worksheet, the end of the worksheet, the cells with data, tables, and formula. How many sheets do I have in this workbook? I have 18. Cells with data, 11,924. And then I have one table, two pivot tables. I have some formulas. I have one chart, and so on. I can get information on the fly about my worksheet and my workbook. I showed you over 60 very useful shortcuts. I categorized them into 15 categories. I created some mind association to help you memorize the shortcuts by number, by character, by same functionality. And finally, I have a hidden sheet with a list of all the shortcuts and the description of what these shortcuts do. So if you right click and unhide and then hit OK, here is the worksheet having all the shortcuts I explained in this tutorial. If you enjoyed this training video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel and ring the bell to be notified when new tutorials are released. The best is yet to come. Thank you for watching 
and see you next time.